he's uh, our uh, resident expert on cultivation and weed management. So, yeah, Here, weed management, away. weed management, and cultivation. I don't have any trouble managing weeds. They manage themselves just fine. <laughs> Can we get the lights? Oh yeah. I want everybody to see if they can pick out the organic farm <laughs> on Google Maps. This is kind of a, a happenstance kind of thing because I never thought anything about it, but one day I was looking on the Google Map and noticed there's a difference between this farm here, which is 520 acres, this 120 is out of it. This was the first farm that March 17th of 2010, I sat down with the owner, the owners of this farm, and Jack Ayersman at Jack Ayersman's house, and it was my start back into certified organic agriculture. And uh, it's pretty profound, you know, if you're farming, if you own a farm and, and it's not organic, it looks kind of like this, uh, some, well, I hit the wrong button here, what almost looks like a wasteland out in here, but yet this soil is very similar to this soil on this farm right here. But you can see a profound difference when you start doing cover crops. So it's not just the organic part, Organic uh, is part of cover crops, and cover crops are part of organic, but uh, the cover crops are the big deal here. And you hear today uh, Dave Campbell, Dave Bishop both talk about cover crops. So if you're here to think about farming organically, transition your land, if you're a landowner or a, or a farmer, the cover crops are really a big, huge key to this whole thing. And uh, so, you know, I always like to show this slide because of the profound. Uh, uh, you know, feeling you get when you look at that, that you're making a huge impact on a little piece of the earth when you start farming organically and using cover crops. What time, what time of year, time of year was that? That was okay. That was probably around May -ish in the spring. Okay. All the all and that's the, a cover crop on the all the cover crop on this side of the creek was terminated. This here was permanent clover and alfalfa that was going to. Uh, be there a year, so we have four-year rotation. This here would have been where the corn was going to go. So, three I'm the devil's of, advocate. Yes, sir. Is it fair to compare and judge the soil of a parcel with a cover crop on it in May, and none of the other parcels have any crop on them? I think you make the point very well. Okay, very good point. I'm glad you bring that up. That's the whole point of the cover crops. I understand that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So but you can't judge the soil by looking at that parcel. Well, because you can't see the soil where the cover. I mean, they've talked about black soil. Yes. And one of the speakers said a different color soil. See, it's yes. gotten darker than it was when that person first came on the farm. Well, but think, at any rate, let's move on. I don't want to. <laughs> well, thank you for bringing it up. Poison is needed. <laughs> if you see the variance from With the dark the to the light to the dark to the light, it's more of an even, yeah, no, even I, though they've been terminated. Yeah. And there is a profound difference that happens in the soil when you have cover crops or something yeah, live no living on because living things are the lungs of that soil. That's and, just common sense. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and that's the great thing Even about organic farming. Even the city boy knows that. That's right. <laughs> and I'm a city that's boy. That's right. Sometimes city boys are easier to, to talk to about it than, than the farm boys. They're they, easier to cheat, too. There you go. <laughs> but I started back in 1980. I went to a guy's field day. I was so impressed with everything I saw that I came home. Uh, there was a guy that was kind of uh, guiding me through the process and... Uh, we had a meeting to meet with the landowners. I farmed a thousand acres of ground, and it was owned by two landowners. It was a son that inherited an 80, and then the other uh, major part of the thousand acres was a, a, a guy and his wife. And uh, I got there on time, but the other guy that was kind of guiding me through this process of going organic, we didn't call it back then that, he had already sat down, they'd already agreed to make the change and so we went cold turkey on a thousand acre my experience was different than Jack Arisman's because totally different soil type totally different time in, in history this was in the 80s and uh, things are always in flux in this process as far as weather uh, different soil types different farmers different equipment different everything so every farmer has to become unique to his farm and learn how to farm that particular parcel of ground but I help field days every day every year 1981 was my first field day. This one I got a day up there in 1989. And uh, I was just 
excited about farming this way, terrified of weeds, by the way, so I wanted to get on the subject of weeds here eventually, eventually because I think most people going to organic, they become terrified about weeds. And I would wake up at night, <laughs> you know, two o'clock in the morning with a, just in a sweat, and I'd take the flashlight out and dig around in the different fields to look for those little white hairs, knowing that that's the beginning, the start of those weeds. Just terrified, and I think most people are when you when you start uh, on a journey like this. But anyhow, we had clean fields back then. I had a field day every year. I didn't hire bean walkers, but one year, all the beans that were walked on the thousand acres, which about a fourth of it was in soybeans every year, a fourth of it in corn, a fourth of it in small grains, and a fourth of it in alfalfa clover. We did have cattle in the operation. And so anyhow, we didn't have a problem with weeds back then. I think the more years, for one thing, we get away from uh, the more years we're using the chemistry on soil, the, the, the glyphosates and the GMO uh, crop residues are going into the soil. What happens is the soil gets poorer and poorer and poorer, and Mother Nature's working harder and harder and harder to fix it, and that's the purpose of the weeds in the first place. <coughs> so my strategy is, is let's do for the soil what it needs, and it'll be last apt to grow weeds. Don't know if that's scientific or not, but that's the way I envision the process. So I'm always trying to do things to tame that soil down a little bit and make it so it's not ferocious, as, as ferocious when it comes to growing weeds. Here's this corn the same year. <clears throat> I was extremely blessed to, to have an opportunity to work this many acres and watch the miracles unfold that Mother Nature has in store for us. It's just unbelievable what Mother Nature can do if you give her a chance and you work with it. You know, going organic is simple, okay? The soil is going to come back, no problem. It knows the program. Okay. The problem is, is the farmer. Okay, he's harder to he, he's harder to grow into the process than the soil is. The soil has no problem with this program. Okay, here a, a, a neighbor is digging in the soil, and I had unbelievable earthworm populations. I'm sure I had an excess of 20 earthworms per cubic foot. The, they were my soil chemistry, my soil chemist. I don't know of any soil chemist that's got two legs that can eat its, eat its way through the soil, and what goes out the back of him, well, maybe it, if I went that far, maybe it is, but the earthworm, the earthworm I, I didn't intend that to be funny, that just kind of happened. But the earthworms eat their way through the soil, and what comes out the back of the earthworm is five to nine and a half times higher in nitrogen than the soil just ate. That is a miracle, okay, that's a miracle. And uh, it's, uh, Phosphorus is seven times higher than the soil it just ate. Potash is 11 times higher than the soil it just ate. Now this is a miracle to me. And so my objective is, is to get as many earthworms working in my soil as possible. Earthworms like livestock, they have to be fed. So that's one of my secrets about, and my thrills of farming this way, is to see the life come back in your soil. Here's just a field of soybeans back in 1989, uh, grown on the what we call back then a biohumic program because organic was non-existent back then. We didn't call it organic. This is before organic come about. And here's uh, wheat on the left and oats on the right. Uh, wheat yields of 40 bushel acre were not uncommon. Uh, oat yields, 100 bushel acre in that area was not uncommon. This is Central Illinois, north of Springfield, Illinois, about 35 miles. I live in Springfield now and manage uh, and work with farms within about 200 mile radius of Springfield that are either certified organic or wanting to transition. And so that's what I do today. I, I don't like the term farm management because farm managers, I envision them as a person that comes down and rolls down their window that far because they don't want dirt or any warm air to get in their nice cool air conditioned truck and they, they converse with the farmer for a few minutes and go back to town and make a spreadsheet. Okay, I don't do I don't I I don't do most of that. Okay, I may work with spreadsheets, but I don't work with uh, driving out in the country and rolling my window down a little ways. I, I'm, I'm telling I'm going to start doing that. That's the next place I'm going to graduate to. But in organic farming, it's all about hands-on. It's not about making a phone call and having somebody control your weeds. So it's something we have to to work with and get better with our abilities. Right here, my soil chemist. So I wanted to introduce to you my soil chemist, and it's all about the soil. To me, it's not about the soil test, okay? And that's one thing I think gets lost in the indoctrination that people get from university type educations. We start focusing on science and we take our eyes off the ball. The ball is, is building soil, not building the soil test, okay? I'm not saying the soil test is, is totally unimportant, 
but what's the most important is building the soil. Okay? If you build the soil, your soil nutrients will come up on your soil test. Okay? And uh, it, it works better that way than the other way around. Now I'm going to show you some before and after pictures because we're going to be talking about cultivation if I can get to it in time before we run out of time here. I got my alarm clock set for, for 1130 and when it goes off, I'm done, we'll go to a panel. And uh, here's a beautiful field of soybeans. Can you see the beautiful field of soybeans? <laughs> okay. Most of the farms I've had the privilege to work on, it was coming into a situation where it's not what you want, it's something fairly ugly, and it can scare you. That's why those of you starting out, if you're starting out with a fairly clean farm because it's had all the chemicals used on it, so there's not much of a buildup of a seed bed out there, or not a very good uh, seed uh, bank out there from wheat seeds, do the very best you can from day one to get very, very serious about weed control and get on top of your weeds, okay, and grass. <laughs> but uh, there is what that same field looks like after the second cultivation. And the story about this is uh, I wasn't working on that farm yet. I was kind of custom hired to come down and cultivate that field using my practices, <coughs> okay, and so... Uh, that's what it did. And there's a field that's uh, right across the ditch from that, that field that was cultivated with conventional type methods of cultivation. I guess you'd call it using a different style of cultivator and uh, using different principles to do the cultivation. And this field of beans made 10 bushel acre soybeans. The other one that you saw previous to this one, that one there made 44 bushels to the acre based on what the, the uh, farmers told me. And so if you figure $20 a bushel what beans are selling for, then that's an increase of about $680 an acre. For a day's work okay i get very excited about cultivation because i'm very excited about the bottom line running out of moisture when we go to plant our corn or beans in this case it'd be corn after alfalfa that is so vital so many times people have cover crops they work the ground too deep the natural irrigating underground irrigation stops because they go too deep and then they run out of moisture but if they don't go too deep that'll keep bringing moisture up natural process and uh, rarely do I have to wait for a rain to plant. And we're talking working ground in uh, primary tillage, sometimes late April, early May, for uh, 20th of May planting for corn. We're talking central Illinois. Here's just a picture of uh, hitting the, uh, the ground with a field cultivator. A lot of people say, well, how do you terminate your alfalfa? If you work that alfalfa ground five inches deep, and then you come back and field cultivate it a couple inches deep, you're not going to kill your alfalfa because that alfalfa has room to move past your sweeps on your field cultivator. But if you're field cultivating about as deep as you worked it with your disc, it's going to shave that right off because it's held tight by the soil it's in. And you'll shave the crown right off and you'll do a lot better job of getting a good kill on your alfalfa clover. Not that I really give a rip. I don't care if I've got some alfalfa clover growing in the corn. I wish I could keep it growing in the corn the whole year, but what happens the corn grows up taller and the bugs start eating the alfalfa pretty soon. The, the, bug, or the, the alfalfa is terminated. Uh, because it can't get the photosynthesis it needs to make energy. Okay. Another a technique I tell people is once you've, did, you've done your last tillage pass for a finished tillage pass before you plant, stay off the ground with your big heavy tractors. So here we're planting with an 82 horsepower tractor pulling a 12 row planter with uh, Yetter pl uh, row cleaners and we never slip a wheel. And there is some rougher ground than this that we're turning and, and going up hills and everything else, it pulls it fine. Because when you come back to rotary hoe that, you can't even tell where the tractor rows are. Because with a rotary hoe, kind of 12 with a 12 row rotary hoe, you have trouble staying on the road because you can't find where the planter pulled in. Because what happens is that tractor leaves very small footprint. We want narrow tires to stay away from the row so we don't compact that <laughs> soil next to the row because that's the soil we're going to throw to the row. This is setting you up so you can do half, half, you know, have half a chance of getting your weeds with the cultivator. If you're compacting that soil close to the row, then that sweep is going to throw a sliver to the row. It's hard to cover up weeds and snuff them out or control them, keep them from knocking down the crop if, it's, if the sweep is thrown slivers rather than loose metal soil. So just a few little things that make all the difference uh, uh, whether you're going to have a successful cultivating job or not. Now. We talked about the stages over here. And so I did a little bit of a, my own research this year. I took on 40 acres that I'm farming myself this year. I, most of the farms, I, all the farms I work on except this 40, uh, they're owned and farmed by somebody else. I just help them out. Okay, June 4th, I planted this soybean. 
at 4.15 p.m. On June, this is a picture of June 5th at 1.56 p.m., 21 hours and 41 minutes later. Now, I could have done better if I had planned the beam right side up instead of upside down. <laughs> so that sprout's got to come all the way around to get to the dirt. So I, I, I can do better. Now, on June 7th, if I turn to the next slide here, June 7th, yeah, that's right, June 7th at 6.04 p.m., 73 hours and 49 minutes later, or three days, one hour and 49 minutes, you can roll them. That's one of the biggest secrets to weed control because you can get yourself in stage one. All right? It's so vital. Now, June 7th, okay, June 8th, there's, now, we've got real hilly ground. <laughs> <laughs> I tried turning that slide around several times and I couldn't get there. Anyhow, June 8th at 3.23 p.m., three days, 23 hours, and eight minutes later, there's what we have. So it's not even four days that bean is up an inch tall. And there's another picture. You know, we farm upside down too. <laughs> First cultivation was June 25th. I'll have pictures of that later on the slides. Ju July 18th was the second cultivation. We received 24 inches of rain from the 3rd of June till the first cultivation. We received 24 inches of rain in five weeks, okay? There was only one day to get in and cultivate. I got all but about four rounds done on this 40 acres, and I had to come back a week later and finish it up, and then I had to wait for an opportunity to get in before the beans got too big, big to give it a second cultivation. There was no rotary hoeing that happened. On the fourth day, there was water between the rows, so it could not rotary hoe it. This again is why it's so vital you may not be able to do everything you want to do. You can't guarantee a perfect year it's going to let you work the ground perfect, let you plant perfect, let you rotary hoe perfect, or harrow, whichever uh, process you use, and cultivate perfect. So you've got to do everything the best you can when you've got the opportunity to do it the best, because you may not get the chance to do one of the operations. Okay? And so I stress that to people. Uh, you can't plan on your cultivator cleaning up the crop. You may not get a chance to do it. We've had fields that only got rotary hoed one time, never even got a second rotary hoeing or a cultivation, and we had a, a fairly clean crop. I mean, not clean by my standards, but I've had to change my standards since I moved down in, in some areas where uh, the heavy black soil, half-inch rain on ground that's not tiled, you're out for a week. I mean, gosh. you know Because you need time to get out there and perform the mechanical uh, process. Here's the field of beans on the 40 acres. Uh, uh, I don't know what day that was taken. It was after. It was either a little bit before the second cultivation or after. Uh, this field from the road, it visibly never appeared to have one single weed in the whole field. And if it did, I snuck out there at night and pulled it. <laughs> and I'm not kidding because I didn't want anybody to see a weed out there. Uh, I did have it walk twice because I wanted every morning glory. I wanted every uh, foxtail. I wanted every... Uh, uh, what was one, uh, I can't think of where the, the, it's the, it's the cousin to the pigweed, the water hen, okay? And I wanted every week because I didn't want anything going to seed. But if I can keep the field pretty clean, then when I go to other crops in the future, I'll have a lower seed bank in the soil, a smaller amount of seeds, and I like that idea. So, anyway, it worked out really well, that's transition. It, the year before it was corn, and uh, corn, about 260 bushel acre corn, and I didn't have time to put a cover crop in because I didn't get the farm, the possession of the farm until March 1st. And so there wasn't enough time it didn't work. Just another picture later on uh, when the rows were completely closed. And this is a 389 Emerge Bean, uh, White Highland Food Grade. Yeah. Okay, I put this slide in here for a real important reason. I was not working with this farm at the time that this picture was taken. I took this picture from the road. Uh, I might have got, you know, didn't want to get in trouble walking out in the field. But this is a perfect example. This field of corn made 30 bushels of the acre. There was 80 acres. It was following alfalfa, alfalfa, clover sod. Okay. It should have made 130 bushels of the acre. But the foxtail just literally took that field. All right. 
And there's a perfect example of the, how vital row crop cultivation is, and it's really worth your time to talk as many of your neighbors as you can into letting you practice on their crops. <laughs> now you laugh, but how many, how many uh, star athletes, uh, Olympic athletes, uh, show up to pole vault at the Olympics and never have practice? Just show up with their pole, okay? And so many times we pole in the field and we haven't done anything to prepare ourselves to be ready to go out there and clean that crop up. So it's really something to think about. Uh, that, that we all need more practice all the time. I try to get a thousand acres underneath my belt every year so I don't forget what I'm telling people whether it works or not. Okay, but here's a situation where what stage do you, would you say we have? Here's the grass, here's the corn. Okay, we got some smaller ones out there, but I don't, want, I don't run a welfare program. The smaller ones, they're toast. Okay, I'm not going to let a few small corn plants I don't care if I wipe out 5,000 of the population, I'm going to try to get 100% weed control. 100% weed control with 25,000 population rather than 30,000 that was probably planted here, you're going to make a whole lot more money than you will if you make 30 bushel corn because the grass and weeds take it. Follow me? When I, when I pull in that field, I'd rather get 100% of the weeds and destroy 25% of the crop than leave, you know, leave 100% of the crop and only get 99% of the weeds. Because 99% of the weeds is about one every foot left. So you thin them out so they can really hurt you. Okay? So it's very vital. And what I do is go into a field like this. And you've got to set your cultivator so you cover up that grass and you leave, leave the corn. Simple, huh? <laughs> now you can go home and you can cultivate. Alright? But there is so much here to be learned. It's cultivated very, very slow. You hear people, uh, I remember when... Uh, uh, Dr. Gruber put uh, a cultivator they use that, that I built for them that uh, uh, they put information about it on Ag Talk, I think it was, and some of the comments were, it's like, oh, we hate cultivating because we can't stay awake and, you know, because you're going so slow on that first cultivator and you're just creeping along. By going really slow, what it does is just push that dirt up a little closer to the corn plant and stop. <coughs> So all those weeds on each side of that corn plant right there is sucking all the nutrients from the center of the rows, never letting it get to the corn. So the corn's got to grow in one little spot here and, and it's got no way to get nutrients unless it can, it can fight for nutrients against the, the grass. And if it's dominant, it can. In this case, it didn't. The grass dominated. Okay. What stage is that? Is it two or three? I'd say that's between one and two. Okay? And I'm going to set my cultivator so I cover up a lot of corn. Okay, I've got to keep raising the fenders, the blades, until it covers up all the grass, and hopefully there's a little corn left. They could, they could have saved that with small hillers, couldn't they? Sure they could have, yes. But this is some of the things that we all need to learn better. There are fields that I cannot, that are beyond my ability, and I keep <coughs> kicking myself. I don't, see, I don't like blaming the rain, because I can't better that. See, a lot of people say, oh, it's the rain, or it's the weather, it's my field, it's whatever. Don't ever blame it on something that you can't change, because you'll never get any better. It's like, whew. My herbicide didn't work. That's what the chemical farmers years ago used to. If the herbicide didn't work, they had an out. It wasn't their fault. <laughs> it was herbicide's fault. See, it's like a drug, you know. And so, uh, always take the responsibility for whatever that field turns out, so that you can get better the next year. Figure out what you got to do to up your game. Now, for myself, I use GPS, Gary's Positioning System. <laughs> okay. And you know that yellow thing on the front of the John Deere cab that said. GPS, RTK sender, or whatever they call it, or receiver. If you were to take that off and put it inside the cab, I bet that tractor wouldn't know where it was. Okay? I don't want a cab on my tractor when I cultivate. That cornfield, if it had been cultivated and made 130 bushels per acre instead of 30, that's 100 bushels. At 12 bushels, dollars a bushel, let's say, which that's probably what corn was then. Then you're talking $1,200 more an acre. Think about that. 80 acres, $1,200 more an acre. That's 80 thousand dollars plus you follow what I'm saying do I care if I've got to be outside for a day and a half or whatever so this is the thing don't ever bargain with success find out what it's going to take and go do it okay because what's a day and a half of your life being a little warm I just take a bag of Ziploc bag of ice I put it on the seat and I sat right on it. <laughs> and that's the truth. Okay? Um, I use the row guide, only I've got one different than this that I built. It goes all the way to the ground. This is the 2940 John Deere. I'm not trying to promote green paint. 
but I am trying to get people to understand the importance of having a tractor. We've got 15 five tires on the back. They're narrow. They're seven and a half inches from the row on each side. That gives plenty of room for loose metal soil to be thrown to the row. We rotary hoe with it. Same thing, so we stay away from that row. It's better for your, root, your rooting and your plants as well if you don't compact it close. We do not use a quick patch. I would not have that on there. It just happens to be on here because we use other things on this tractor. Uh, I like a tractor where you can see the ground. And you can't buy a newer tractor that you can see the ground. We do have some GPS set, set up on one farm that I'm working on. But if, you've got a, if you're going to do it freehand, you need a tractor you can see the ground. Remember the old Farmal M's and H's and John Deere Model A's and B's? The only thing there was between you and that row down there was an axle about that big around. Axle housing. Okay? You can see everything. Okay? And now they make tractors with this big old platform. Okay? And you can't see anything. And if my GPS sender up here, my eyes, my ears, and the seat of my pants can't get all the information that I need, I can't stay on the row. And so it's just one of those things you get real frustrated and you're having trouble cultivating. A lot of times just the power unit you're using. And uh, I make it so everything works. I'm going to be adjusting this maybe at some point. I want this all cleaned up and, and everything prepared right. These sway blocks are down. I'm going to have those sway blocks up. I do not run with the sway blocks down unless we're using the GPS unit on one of the newer uh, tractors on another farm. The reason why is, is I'm not that good. I want that cultivator to lie for me. <clears throat> okay? If you get off three inches and you've got the sway box down like that, when you whip to get back on, you're going to take out a row. If your marker gets off three inches momentarily and you whip it back on, it's going to lie for you. It's going to average whatever you do with your row, with your, with your row guide. Okay? So it's vital that you swing the blocks up. Most people are going to put them down thinking that's the way they need to do it. I'm not that good. Okay? Just quick things about the row crop cultivator that I use. Uh, I like the sweep, multi-sweep cultivator. Uh, the stiff shank, this is what makes it a stiff shank right here. Okay? I like it that I can set the pitch of the sweeps so it, it, it controls how the dirt flows. And, uh, also, I'm kind of uh, very particular. If you notice, it looks like one single bar across here. There are eight behind that, the same height. I don't want them different height. I want them the same height. There's a reason for that. There's a method to my madness. But I'll spend several days getting that cultivator set up to perfection, okay, in the shed on a concrete floor. Reason for it. But uh, won't go into that today. It's, we don't have enough time. But here again, set up everything straight. There again, if you see here, there's eight more of those bars right behind that one. I want them all the same height. When I spin around, my head snap back my head and turn back around and keep that tractor on the mark. I want to have. I take a photograph in my head, and when I'm turning around driving, I'm thinking about what I saw. If one gang is like this and one's like this because they're all out of adjustment, I can't. I can't. I can't assimilate that. Okay. When I turn around on the end, I want to know if one of the blades have dropped down. You don't maybe know what that is, but if they're all at the same angle then I know if one slipped or not, or if they're where they need to be. But if everything's out of, out of you know, cockeyed and haywire, you can't tell. So I set it up to near perfect that I can. Here is a, a view from the back. I'm running five sweeps on 30-inch rows. One, two, three, four, or five. The first throw of soil comes off the first line of defense right here. Okay. I set this as a picture from 2010. I set it up with three inches on each side of the row. When I set a cultivator up, if you've never measured your planter, don't set your cultivator up until you've measured your planter. Your planter was probably assembled at your John Deere dealership. If you have a John Deere International or whatever, it's, it's assembled. It used to be assembled at the dealership. They don't do that anymore. I think they come from the factory or assembled. But you can measure planters. Some of the runners or some of the disc openers will be set on 31 inches, some on 32, some on 28. They all need to be adjusted to be at 30. Okay? And if they're not, then it gets to be a challenge to cultivate. Because when you set this in here, and when you're running with this with maybe an inch and three quarter on each side, this mark, which represents where the planter is supposed to be planting, has to be on the money. I take a plumb bob and I drop down from the dead center of this cultivator to the floor and I put a mark right there on the floor. That's the dead center of that, of that machine. And I measure over 15 inches. That's the dead center of the first row to the right. And I do the same to the left. Then I keep reeling out my tape measure until I've got every row marked. And I set that cultivator to be as exact as possible before I ever think about going to the field. 
is so vital. Now, when I talk about the second, throw a soil first and knock down the crop. This one here throws the soil and covers it up. The reason why I can't use a three sweep system is because when you set your first shanks too cl real close to the row, you've got too much real estate to cover with only one more sweep. Plus, you cannot control whether this baby throws <coughs> dirt this way or it throws more this way. And I've got to control completely how much soil flow <coughs> goes off every one of these sweeps. This one and this one. This one you can control with a blade or a fender. We'll see those here in a little bit. But those are just some of the issues of what I put up with when I'm setting a cultivator. I want it to be perfectly level when I pick that cultivator up. I want to be able to mail, ma measure from the bottom side of the very far end of the cultivator toolbar and be exactly the same, same number of inches right to the quarter of an inch to the other end. So if I'm in a field and I get in a little wet spot, I want to be able to raise that and cheat it out a little bit and keep from turning myself. Yes, sir, I got three minutes? Okay, I got to talk real fast here. <laughs> okay? Uh, from the front side, the front sweeps, they're going to be up a little bit. They're not going to be set flat. I put a, a, about an inch and three-quarter inch block. It's a two-by-four block underneath every gauge wheel on that collimator to set them precisely the same depth. I even spin the wheel to make sure I got the same pressure on the block. And when you go to the field, if it's following a wheel track, you'll have to adjust that. Okay? But it's vital to get everything exact. Now, this here is set on three inches because I hadn't run a tractor for 20 years and I was getting back into going to be sitting on a tractor, so I gave myself a little bit more space. I do run these as close as, if I've got stage four, using blades, I can do a pretty good job cleaning up stage four field. I'm going to move this end to where I can physically cut the weeds off and I'll, I'll move that in an inch and a half to an inch and three quarter on each side and run five and a half, six mile an hour. They're not my beans, they're somebody else's. <laughs> <laughs> you will not go to sleep. You will actually cut out more crop than if you set them wide because you can't stay away. I guarantee you, you're going to stay away. You can't go, you can't go a split second. You've got to stay on the money. Around corners, side hills, you've got to learn to make a mental adjustment. Okay. And there's the same field of beans. There's when I come out to call it, and there's how much dirt I throw, how ugly I make it. There's what it turned out later. And here's just a picture, a still picture where I stop. The fender's actually pushing and almost touch when you're on the move. There's just the front view, how close I sit the fender. Let's, and there's the 40-acre field of soybeans. Can you play a video?